Good evening. I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of all my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. Thank you for joining us this evening. Special welcome to the immigration politics class at Skidmore College, led by Bob Turner. Welcome. I'd like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and AT&T, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. Immigration was always of special interest to President John F. Kennedy and the Kennedy family. And we are so grateful to have this timely opportunity to explore these critical issues with our distinguished guests this evening. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. I'd like to extend a warm virtual welcome to Teresa Cardinal Brown, Director of Immigration and Cross-Border Policy at the Bipartisan Policy Center. She came to BPC in 2014 from her own consulting firm, Cardinal North Strategies, and has more than 20 years of experience in immigration law and policy. She has served as Director of Immigration and Border Policy at the US Chamber of Commerce and Associate Director of Business Immigration Advocacy at the American Immigration Lawyers Association, has worked in the immigration practices of large law firms and served in several government positions during the administrations of George W. Bush and Barack Obama. I'm delighted to welcome Roberto Gonzalez virtually. He is professor of education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and director of the Immigration Initiative at Harvard, a university-wide effort aimed at advancing and promoting interdisciplinary scholarship and intellectual exchange around issues of immigration policy and immigrant communities. His research centers on contemporary processes of immigration and social inequality and stems from theoretical interests at the intersection of race and ethnicity, immigration and policy. His work has been cited across a broad range of disciplines and has garnered awards from sociology, anthropology, psychology, education, law and social work. It's a pleasure to welcome Marcelo Suarez Orozco, Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Prior to UMass Boston's, uh, his arrival there last year, he served as the inaugural UCLA Wasserman Dean, leading two academic departments, 16 nationally renowned research institutes, and two innovative demonstration schools at UCLA's Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. His research focuses on cultural psychology and psychological anthropology with an emphasis on education, globalization, and migration. His award-winning books and edited volumes have been published by leading university presses and his scholarly papers in a range of disciplines and languages appear in leading journals. He regularly contributes to national and international media outlets. I'm so pleased to welcome Daniel Tishner, the Philip H. Knight Chair of Social Science and director of the Wayne Morse Center's Program for Democratic Engagement at the University of Oregon. He has published seven books, received numerous research awards, served as a research fellow at the Brookings Institution and Princeton School of Policy and International Affairs, and was named to the inaugural class of Andrew Carnegie Fellows in 2015. He has testified and provided expert briefings to Congress on immigration law and policy, and provided commentary and essays for many national publications. And I know he has conducted a lot of research within the JFK Presidential Library. I'm also delighted to welcome Jia Lin Yang, national editor at the New York Times. She previously served as deputy national editor at the Times, as well as deputy national security editor at the Washington Post, where she was part of a team that won a Pulitzer Prize. Before becoming an edit editor, she wrote about business and economics at The Post and at Fortune Magazine for over a decade. She's, she is the author of One Mighty and Irresistible Tide, The Epic Struggle Over American Immigration, 1924 to 1965. Finally, I'm so pleased to welcome Julia Preston, our moderator for this evening's discussion to the library virtually this evening. She is a contributing writer for the Marshall Project, 
a nonpartisan, nonprofit news organization covering criminal justice. She previously covered immigration for the New York Times for 10 years, and she was a member of the Times staff that won the 1998 Pulitzer Prize for reporting on international affairs. She has worked as an editor and for a foreign correspondent for the Times, and before that, the Washington Post, and her work has won numerous awards. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Thank you. Thank you to the Kennedy Library and to Alan Price and Liz Murphy and the staff for organizing this extraordinarily timely uh, panel and for gathering such a distinguished group of, um, of scholars and researchers to discuss this issue of immigration. Today, in the opening months of the Biden administration, a cycle of American history and policy on immigration is repeating itself. President Trump, in his four years in office, amplified the xenophobic hostility towards immigrants that has always been inherent in American society. He broadcasted it from the White House, and his policies were permeated with restrictionist views. Now, President Biden evokes a nearly opposite spirit uh, on immigration, a spirit that has also been present in American society and one that welcomes refugees and immigrants and celebrates their ingenuity and their grit. But photographs we are seeing this week of small children in rows packed into grim tents holding centers at the border are a reminder of uh, an immigration system that is dysfunctional, chaotic, and failing in many respects. And uh, President Biden has said that the time is right for broad reform and advocates and activists who cheered President Biden's election have queued up a series of very ambitious uh, bills before Congress to achieve that reform. But many who have worked for years to analyze and re uh, repair the immigration system, including I think some of our panelists worry that the problems in the immigration system have become too big to fix. So I'll start with, this is what we're gonna talk about tonight. And I'll start off by asking our panelists a round of questions uh, designed to sort of fill in the historical background um, and the social background of this debate. So I'll start with you, uh, Chancellor Suarez Orozco, Marcelo. Uh, give us a little, give, give us a big picture, give, briefly paint the big picture here of the current dynamics of migration as it is uh, coming into the United States. How have the forces that are propelling migration changed? Thank you, Julia. I'm so delighted. I am so very happy to be a part of this important library forum. I'm happy as a member of the board of the Library Foundation. I am happy as an American by choice. That's what we immigrants are. And I am happy as chancellor of UMass Boston to join in this important conversation. In one of the passages that we always come back to in a nation of immigrants, President Kennedy wrote, quote, another way of indicating the importance of immigration to America is to point out that every American who ever lived with the exception of one group, was either an immigrant himself or a descendant of immigrants." End of quote. Indeed, in our country, immigration is at once history and destiny. It is a story of how our country came to be in its present form, and it is the future. As the fastest growing sector of the US child and emerging adult population, now are the children of immigrants. That's the first of my three points in two minutes. Second point, in the current era, migrations are extraordinarily complex, multi-determined, and escape vulgar, mechanistic models of causality. After holding for three quarters of a century, the map tracing the major migration corridors of the post-World War II era with labor migration, begetting family reunification, begetting the rise of the, the second generation, 
that map has become increasingly blurred and a new map of mass migration is emerging. Third, third point, there are three disparate formations that lay the foundations for uh, an emerging new US migration cartography. First, the end of the Cold War significantly accelerated human migrations to our country. Second, the worldwide economic crisis of 2008 and the anti-government uprisings in North Africa and the Middle East beginning in 2010 signal another significant turn. Third, President Trump's moves to make good on the campaign promises that elected him, rapidly stepping up deportations of unauthorized immigrants in the US, building a 2,000 mile concrete wall along the Mexican border, marked a brusque, brusque turning point in the migration landscape to our country. Migration now, as we're witnessing in the southern border, is increasingly defined by uncontrolled criminality, war and terror, and unchecked climate change. Central America's so-called Northern Triangle is exhibit A. Symbiotically, these forces, the forces of war, war and terror, unchecked criminality, and unchecked climate change are the three forces that synergetically are driving what I call in, my, in our most recent volume, the catastrophic migrations of the 21st century. A new map is unfolding before our very eyes. Um, Gia, uh, I'm gonna take my next question to you because uh, in honor of the, of the forum where we find ourselves today and to ask you to reflect and, and share a bit of history uh, which is the uh, political evolution that John Kennedy underwent that you write about in your book as he was rising, running for senator the first time and then going forward as he, as he uh, launched his campaign and, and ran for president. And I, so, so I'm sure people would be interested to hear about that moment in Kennedy's political evolution. And maybe you can just reflect a little bit about what that might mean what you what you see that might mean for uh, reform now yes it's such an honor to be here because i um had the honor of doing research at the jfk presidential library and really enjoyed digging into the part of the archives that deal with the history of a nation of immigrants this now famous book um it has a fascinating history so it actually began as just a 40-page pamphlet that uh President Kennedy, then a senator, wrote, and it, basically the Anti-Defamation League had invited him to just write this, um, the heir to the grape welch, uh, sorry, the welch grape juice uh, fortune was trying to fund different pamphlets for students to read about sort of different civics issues. And so they invited Kennedy, then a young senator, to write this pamphlet. The pamphlet then in 1963 gets turned into a full-blown book. One of his aides really begins to expand on it. You know, it's not something that Kennedy was frankly very involved in. Um, I think Meyer Feldman, his aide, was much more deeply engaged in expanding it. Arthur Schlesinger was brought in to sort of get it, get the history right. Um, tragically, they were in the middle of doing this right when he was assassinated. And so after he was killed, the book project took on this greater significance um, the rest of them finished it with Teddy Kennedy helping. And then the book became part of kind of this moral argument for the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, which my book is about and really just totally changed um, our entire perception of who would be allowed in the country. The thing I'd say about Kennedy that I think is applicable to now that's so interesting, you know, this is a family, um, you know, his father, Joe Sr., I don't think of having read a lot about him as someone who wanted the family to seem very Irish. You know, this was a time when ascending the ladder in American society meant you wanted to seem less Irish and more like a wasp. You wanted to seem like you were just a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. It was only when Kennedy, um, JFK, his son, began to have political ambitions that getting involved in immigration as an issue, owning himself as an identity of being Irish American, I'd argue was a bit of like a act of political opportunism, right? This is a family that had spent years trying to convince everyone that they were the waspiest family ever, right? They're sailing, they're at Hyannisport, they're at these bastions of like really elite white culture. And yet for JFK to ascend, he has to really embrace what it means to be Irish American. 
And it's also a moment when there's a new nationalism, I'd argue, being born around a nation of immigrants, right? So before this, you would, it, it, we kind of take it for granted. I think before you think of immigrants as a thing that is less American, right? It's, it's like immigrants are kind of oppositional to the idea of nationalism. But in the 50s, as JFK is rising, as his career is rising, it's a moment when there's a new nationalism coming into being from historians like Oscar Hanlon that say, actually, what makes America so American are the immigrants. The immigrants don't take away from Americanness, they make America what it is. And so Kennedy's career really rises with this new mythology, this new conception of American identity. He embraces being Irish American. And I think for right now, it's so relevant because I think for people who want to change the system, this idea of, of tying immigrants to Americanness, right? It's sort of the opposite of what Trump was doing. That's one formula for getting, for making change. And it's, it's sort of what a lot of reformers rode through the 60s to get to the 1965 Act. Um, and the last thing I'd say with Kennedy that's so interesting is that he's also embracing in this moment when he's taking off this kind of hyphenated identity, right? He's saying, I am Irish, I'm also American. And that kind of thinking, I think, is only now, you know, it's only grown, right? Because we're an even more multicultural country. We have a lot of people identify as, you know, a hyphenated something. And someone like Kennedy rose and was beloved for that, right? It used to be that you would hide such a thing. But I feel like his career is a bit of a template for what kind of an earlier version of a multicultural America would look like arguing for more generous immigration policies. So anyway, okay. it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here because the history of Kennedy himself, I think is so important to understand for our current um, immigration debate. Yes, indeed. Um, and so Dan, uh, now we'll go to you and uh, bring, bring us up uh, to right before the present. So. I guess my question to you is when you look at President Trump, his nativism, his approach to uh, immigration politics, was this an aberration or an expression of something that has um, been a factor in American politics for a long time? And how do you see that nativism affecting, uh, how has it affected the possibilities for immigration reform in recent times? Yeah, so I, I guess my short answer is it's it's both an aberration and something that's been with us for a long time. An aberration in the sense that, you know, we have not had such an overtly nativist president um, who actually gained office by making, you know, anti-immigrant appeals so central um, really since, you know, the 1920s. Um, but as you, as you, I think, underscored in your question, Julia, you know, um, the, these, you know, kind of xenophobic tempers have been kind of persistent features of American uh, uh, life, um, really, uh, since the founding. And um, so we were just talking about the nation of immigrants. Um, we've been a very restive, contentious nation of immigrants, one that has, you know, always celebrated its immigrant past, but dreaded the immigrant present, felt very uneasy about the latest newcomers. Um, and so I promise to bring you up to present, but you know, think about Chinese exclusion, racist national origins quotas, eugenics, and so forth. This has always kind of been part of the American experience, as well as the Statue of Liberty and 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 our you know celebrating um, uh, this tradition of of immigration. Um, so immigration reform is always incredibly tough to achieve. That is that has just been one of the you know the constants um, in American politics. And you know, think about you know you've had business interests, labor, ethnic groups, immigrant rights, civil rights groups, immigration restrictionists. You know, so um, to get to your question about you know where is restrictionism today on this, I think um, the I would say Julia that you know one of the real dilemmas. The last time that we had comprehensive immigration reform that addressed you know the fact that we had millions of undocumented immigrants in the country and questions about porous borders and so forth was the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986. So we literally have been stuck in neutral for decades. Um, and we've, we've had significant efforts that took place in 2001 um, during the Bush administration, and that was derailed with 9-11. We had efforts, um, again, during the Bush administration, 2006 and 2007, but something had changed. Between 2001 2000, and 2006-7, in the base of the Republican Party, 
um, you had the growth of a very strong immigration restriction movement that was that was quite powerful. You had members of Congress um, who were not not as centrist as uh, George W. Bush on this issue, um, who fought hard against um, producing comprehensive reform. And so really, you know, it was that shift within the party that kind of undid in the past to get comprehensive immigration reform, you needed to get a compromise. And usually the bargain entailed, you know, some element of legalization, um, uh, some uh, enhanced enforcement, employer sanctions, and some kind of guest worker program. But 2001, 2006, 2007, fast forward to Obama and, uh, and 2013, you couldn't put together those kind of deals because in Congress, the you know both the you know the, those who were on the right and those on the left were at loggerheads and unwilling to engage in those kind of bargains as they had in past. So, um, very quickly, what we were left then with is this you know profound, intense polarization of both parties, both at the base, at the grassroots, and in Washington, um, which made it kind of mission impossible for even you know uh, the most ambitious ambitious administrations and lawmakers to get through comprehensive reform as in the past. So what that has meant is that most policymaking has been done through unilateral executive action, which obviously lacks the continuity of significant legislative reform. So with that, I'll- Which is a great <laughs> intro uh, for me to go to Roberto, who, uh, Roberto, your research is about immigrant youth and particularly young immigrants who are contending with the with with undocumented immigration status and and all of the issues that are surrounding that and uh, you know President Obama gave us or gave them a form of protection he used his executive authorities to give them a form of protection that is known as DACA and so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about DACA, about the this generation of young immigrants, and what the advantages and what the limitations have been of that kind of protection, uh, and, and to kind of set the stage for uh, the next round of questions, where we'll talk about the proposals that are taking place now. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Julia. It's a it's a real honor to be here. Um, so I want to draw, maybe zoom out a little bit from your question and, and talk about this policy trend towards these semi-legal statuses like DACA that are not fully unauthorized status, but aren't fully legal statuses either. Um, so there's a general consensus, I think, re regarding these kind of bright boundaries of these dichotomous categories, but there are growing numbers of migrants in the United States and, and around the globe more generally who possess these statuses that are much more fuzzy beyond these dichotomous stat categories. So increasing numbers of migrants today occupy these statuses that are temporary, uncertain, and nonlinear. Um, we could think about statuses like temporary protected status, um, like DACA, also like def deferred enforcement departure, which is a president's presidential discretion. Um, those waiting for green cards under the Violence of Women Act or the U visa program, um, the, the very long backlog of young people who are under a special immigration, immigrant juvenile status. So you got growing numbers and a growing trend towards these semi-legal statuses that many of them don't ever lead to any kind of formal legal status. Um, and so for those possessing these liminal statuses, they often live in a state of limbo um, that can persist indefinitely, sometimes, as I said, never leading to citizenship or any other form of formal integration. I mean, certainly like DACA beneficiaries, and we're, we're certainly aware of them, they, uh, they occupy, they, they enjoy certain rights and privileges, um, but their precarious status um, places limits on, on range of activities, um, such as receipt of social services, for example. Um, in addition, they're, um, while they're sometimes able to renew these statuses and the benefits that come with them for DACA beneficiaries, for example, for TPS holders, uh, that means work authorization, stays of deportation. Um, but for many of them, having to 
to continually um, reapply um, in their renewal periods, a period of non-renewal for them can push them out of status, um, even if temporarily. And that has resulted in job loss, bureaucratic hurdles, stress, you name it. So ultimately, the durability of these statuses is really called into question precisely because the tension between access and exclusion between belonging and vulnerability that characterizes their daily experiences remains unresolved. And you, you think about having these, these statuses in the context of heavy enforcement, and we've ratcheted up enforcement over the last two decades um, increasingly. And so while they, do, they may enjoy certain uh, access to the polity, they're always, they're, there's always this kind of a looming threat of enforcement for them and, and, and for their family members. So it's a kind of a half in and half out um, Yeah, that, 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 that's right, Julia, and, and, and never really either way. Um, and there, there may be certain times, certain places uh, where they are kind of more legal or, or even less legal. Um, but these kinds, of, these, these, these kinds of administrative policies really create uh, this limbo that sows the seeds of vulnerability, continues vulnerability. All right, well, we'll talk more about DACA, but you know, we have this image of the, of the dreamers and of, the, of, the, of being this sort of triumphant class of young immigrants. And your research really is a cautionary tale about that, um, that this is really a very difficult and potentially psychologically damaging situation for many of these young people. Yeah, these are, you know, these are young people who, um, you know, many of them um, move to the US with their parents at six months old, at two years old, at five years old, grow up alongside of American born friends and peers are uh, in the same neighborhoods, they're educated in the same schools, but at a really critical time when their friends are moving forward, obtaining driver's licenses, um, taking after school jobs, um, obtaining financial aid for college, starting careers, you think about those, those kind of normative trajectories is that they're, they're hitting walls. Um, and this blocked access, um, uh, particularly over time, has a, has a, a real uh, debilitating effect for many of these young people. These, the, this is really the embodiment of Langston Hughes's dream deferred, what happens to these young people. Um, who grow up being promised that if you work hard enough, that if you dream boldly enough, there will be something there for you. But ultimately, um, you know, we've been waiting, we've been waiting for, for 20 years and them and their families have been waiting for 20 years for, for some sort of legislation like the DREAM Act to pass. All right, well, we'll, we'll come back to that. Teresa, the border. Um, so, so yeah, uh, to, um, uh, you know, the, these images that we've seen, finally, the photographers got in, uh, in, I guess, yesterday to the, uh, to one of these holding uh, facilities uh, where the, um, between cu Customs and Border Protection and, and the Department of Health and Human Services, they've had to sort of park these kids because they're, the facilities on either side are completely swamped. Mm -hmm. So, Give us the background to this. I mean, um, under President Obama and especially under President Trump, what was the evolution of border enforcement? And, and, and what are the flows, how are the flows of uh, migrants in the hemisphere, how are they changing, have they been changing coming up to this moment now? Well, thanks so much to you and thanks to the John F. Kennedy Library for inviting me. Um, so I'm gonna take uh, the benefit of one of my colleagues as well to go back a little bit further in time. Uh, when we think about migration at the US-Mexico border, uh, first of all, for a lot of Americans, that is the image of immigration. It's either Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty or people running across uh, the border from Mexico. Uh, there's not a lot of in between. and. That, that perception uh, that migration across the US-Mexico border is uh, illegal, it's dangerous, it's, um, it's, it's a, a, a symptom of uh, that we're not able to control our borders. 
um, really belies the history of that border. For much of the United States history, that border between the United States and Mexico was wide open and people could cross there regularly. Um, as a matter of fact, until the 1965 Act, there was not any limitation on migration from the Western Hemisphere. And so one of the, um, one of the outcomes of the 1965 Act of those limitations was the need for security along the US-Mexico border. We had had programs like the Bracero program, which generated circular migration from Mexico uh, from World War II until the early 1960s. Um, there were lots of problems with that program, but it, it, it created that sort of interdependence uh, of the United States and Mexico in labor markets um, and the joined uh, border region um, that we kind of know today. Um, but since 1965, um, there have been progressive efforts at securing that border from unlawful migration. Um, I think in particularly uh, starting, believe it or not, in the Clinton years. Um, from 1996, when there was a law passed on immigration enforcement, primarily the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act signed under President Clinton, uh, they started building fences along the U.S.-Mexico border, starting in, in San Diego, um, and continuously reinforcing uh, and policing and militarizing that border. But for most of that time, for up until, frankly, uh, the mid-2010s, the majority of people trying to come into the United States across the border were Mexicans, mostly single adults, mostly male, and mostly seeking work. So they were labor migrants uh, who did not have access to visas, who were coming into the United States to work in the United States. They were trying to evade detection, and most of them, when apprehended, if they were apprehended, would be returned pretty much summarily and fairly quickly to Mexico. So our border infrastructure, the systems that processed migrants along that border were built for very short term holding. The border patrol stations that exist along the border look like your local police precinct. They have short term holding jail cells and computer terminals for agents to get identifications from people and enter them into the systems. And that was the way the border has worked for several decades, for half a century. But we have seen increasingly over time uh, other nationalities coming to that border. And what started happening, particularly in the mid 2010s, uh, around 2011, 2012, is that we started seeing a significant increase in Central American migration from those Northern Triangle countries of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, and unaccompanied children. Now, laws that have been in place since 2002 with the Homeland Security Act and 2008 with the Trafficking Victims Protection Act had rules for how we treated unaccompanied minors at the border. First of all, they were required to be uh, interviewed to see if they were victims of trafficking. That was the main important thing. Were they, were they being trafficked across the border? Were they in danger? Um, secondly, they were given access to the immigration system if that was the case. For those who are Mexicans, and there were unaccompanied Mexican children arriving during this time, for the most part, if they were not trafficking victims, they would be returned back to Mexico to the Mexican uh, authorities to help reunite them with family in Mexico. But if they were not from Mexico, they were to be turned over to the Department of Health and Human Services, provided with healthcare, education, case management, until they could be placed with a sponsor in the United States who usually was a relative of that individual and their cases would be pursued in the United States. That system was fine when the average number of these children was no more than a couple of thousand a month. The system was enough to, to handle that. But in 2011, 2012, 2013, and particularly in 2014, we saw a, pre a, a precipitous increase in the arrival of these children such that the systems that were in place could no longer handle them. The capacity was not there. So they were getting backed up at border patrol stations. They didn't have transport to get them to health and human services facilities. The facilities that health and human services were running were also getting full. And so the Obama administration helped build these excess capacity places like um, down in, in Texas. And those were, the, those were the first time we saw the pictures of the warehouse with the chain link fences in them and the children behind the chain link fences and people called it kids in cages. These were overflow facilities that were meant to handle the rapid increase in children coming to the border. Um, 
the Obama administration did invest in trying to expand health and human services capacities and other things. But very quickly, the unaccompanied children turned into families and these families were seeking asylum. So unlike Mexican adults who were usually summarily turned back to Mexico, families who had an asylum claim had to be admitted to the United States to have that asylum claim interviewed, uh, at least to find credible fear and sometimes more to have that case go to the immigration court system. So families that may have sent their children unaccompanied first then started arriving as families and then the families overtook the systems. So what we have seen for the last eight years in ebbs and flows over time is a persistent shift in the arrival of migrants at that border from Mexicans seeking work to Central Americans, particularly families and children seeking asylum. And we have not invested in our asylum process or system or infrastructure to recognize that change. Successive administrations, including the Obama administration, invested in detention facilities for families, invested in uh, programs that would allow them to rapidly turn people away or process cases without really hearing asylum, asylum cases. And that quadrupled under the Trump administration. In 2019, we saw the highest number of, uh, of families uh, arriving at the border from Central America. And since 2014, there have been seven times when each year Central Americans have been more than Mexicans arriving at the border. And so that, that persistent um, issue uh, continues to, to, ha to, have, to have ramifications for the Biden administration, an administration that, that ran on trying to turn back Trump's policies that shut down the asylum system for almost everybody. Um, but is still now having to grapple with, well, if I open that back up, do I have the capacity to process the people coming? And that's, right. one, that's, one, of the, that's one of the issues why we're seeing this again, okay. that the United States over several administrations now has not decided to rethink um, the processes and infrastructure that were developed for a very different type of migration. Okay. Um, Marcelo, I'm going to go back to you um, and ask a broader question along the same lines uh, that uh, Teresa just framed, which is, you know, we have an immigration system that's built on family reunification and certain kinds of, of pretty restricted labor migration. And when you look at the, at the American immigration concept and framework, how in sync or out of sync is it now for the kinds of migration flows that you would expect to see um, soon and in the future? Thank you, Julia. Um, with um, the um, with the new uh, reality of unchecked climate change and. Um, more broadly speaking, uh, ecological uh, disasters that are pushing uh, greater and greater numbers of human beings, including children and families. Uh, we see this uh, in Central America is exhibit A. Uh, you take the Northern Triangle and you see uh, from the ecological origins of the so-called Soko War between El Salvador and Honduras. This goes back historically to Hurricane Mitch that really began the momentum, the kinetic momentum of the first wave of Hondurans coming into the United States to the current dynamics in, in terms of the environment in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Um, you see, um, just a, a wicked, wicked synergy that is pushing, uh, pushing uh, increasingly very large numbers of people into uh, what Roberto um, called this limbo, uh, this limbo world. Uh, very important to, to keep in mind the following. Uh, only one in 10 uh, for, forcibly um, displaced uh, persons today will make it out of uh, the Americas, out of Latin America, will make it out of Asia, will make it out of Africa. The vast majority will remain in neighboring countries. 
really creating what is the largest crisis of confinement in human history. Only one in 10 will make it to the US border or will make it to any of the European countries. The structures and the strictures that have been in place since World War II are um, predicated on some fundamental principles that are somewhat anachronistic to the realities of the 21st century. The conceptual center of gravity for the Geneva Conventions is the idea of non-refoulement, the French notion that um, until safety um, will, can be guaranteed in the country of origin, uh, you will be protected. You will be protected and you will not be returned. What we have now is a very, very di different dynamic, which is um, we are seeing um, uh, larger, larger zones of, of, uh, of confinement that are acting really as a, a buffer zones where, you know, what the great Hannah Arendt once called the right to have rights becomes completely elusive. You can't access these fundamental rights because you're not going to be able to access the opportunity to make those claims. This is the fundamental catastrophe we're uh, uh, seeing the world over. Uh, we see this in the Middle East, we see this in Africa, we see this elsewhere in Asia, and this is the dynamic in uh, Central America uh, today. We have uh, a dynamic that is no longer uh, ready to uh, accept or metabolize the fact that entire regions of, of the world are not so easily, you can't so easily return to until and unless we create the fundamental structures, the institutions that give folk the opportunity of not migrating. The right to not migrate should also be considered a fundamental right. What we see today is increasingly a um, catastrophic flight into greater forms of, of confinement and the elusive quest to access fundamental rights is disappearing. And what we see in the in the in the camp, in in the in the warehouses that Teresa so eloquently outlined for us is a manifestation of this broader global phenomenon. This is what's going on in off the coast of Australia. This is what's going on in Turkey. This is what's going on in the Turkey-Syria border. This is what's going on in so many regions of the world. Zones of confinement, zones where the right to access rights is, is, is disappearing. So we are not prepared, the, the structures in place in our country that flow mostly from the idea of labor migration, as Teresa mentioned. I mean, the Veracero program, who would have thought? World War II, we went to Mexico knocking on the door asking Mexicans to come to work uh, for the war, uh, during the war effort. The, the, the Europeans did put in place similar programs. You, you see them, uh, you saw that in, in Germany. You know, this idea of the guest, the guest, uh, the immigrant as a guest. You know, uh, there's nothing more permanent than guest programs. There's nothing more permanent than guest uh, um, migration. Uh, the permanent populations now that we see, not only in our country, uh, but in Germany, in the Netherlands, and in the United Kingdom, all flow from these kinds of programs that weren't fully articulated for the end of incorporating really fully the longing that we hear in, in Roberto's voice to be fully incorporated into the family of the nation. That is becoming more and more elusive. All right, so that gives us an opportunity for, uh, for Dan and Roberto. Dan, I'll go to you first. Let's talk about immigration reform. Are we gonna, uh, you know, we have President Biden has made a plan. His plan has been introduced as these very uh, sweeping bills in both the House and the Senate. Uh, you have uh, Senator Alex Padilla, who is, uh, has a, a plan for 
uh, a pathway to citizenship for essential workers. Uh, and Roberto will talk about the Dream and Promise Act. And, uh, but Dan, I mean, how do you see it? Uh, what are the, how, how do you see these uh, uh, political forces that you've been talking about? Uh, how are they going to impact the debate uh, in the first two years of the Biden administration on immigration reform? Yeah, I mean, so it, it's a mammoth package, right? I mean, so most of the folks who you know have been following immigration politics for some time um, looked at what was rolled out and said, "Wow, it's incredibly ambitious. It's it's addressing you know everything," and um, and in some ways you could look at this and say, "It seems that the the Biden team uh, you know learned from the Obama experience. You know, the, the early Obama years, um, the approach was." Let's try to build up our bona fides, showing um, you know conservatives and border hawks that we can be really good at enforcement. That then won Obama the the moniker of of, of deporter in chief from Dreamers. Um, and in, in any case, by the time Obama uh, uh, you know was able to really uh, you know lean into immigration reform, he had lost his majorities in Congress, right, and put other priorities first. And so one of the things that was sort of a, a, a game changer this time was that um, President Biden, you know, put this really broad reform, legal immigration reform, um, uh, path to citizenship, whole host of, um, of, of changes on the table on day one. And it was a big package. Um, and as its congressional sponsors said, we want to go big um, and, and, you know, go after our biggest principles. But those same uh, lawmakers also said that we think that the, you know, that um, we're very open to piecemeal approaches, which was basically just, you know, you know, being realistic and saying, look, we're we're throwing a Hail Mary pass on this, but we know that with the 50-50 Senate, um, with a reconciliation process that probably can't be used for this and so forth, that um, it's going to be very hard to achieve. Um, so um, as such, you know, I mean, and, and if, if, if those have been following kind of the infrastructure bills, um, you know, it looks like, uh, you know, Speaker Pelosi said that she's hoping by July 4th that they'll have this massive infrastructure package together. Um, others are saying it's Oops. And so as a result, you know, um, in all likelihood. Are we losing Dan? Dan, we can't hear you. Now. Sorry. Can you, can you hear me okay now? Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, such as such as Zoom land sometimes, right? So um, in essence, all, all I was trying to underscore is that, you know, even though um, the Biden administration put forward this massive package from day one, like the Obama administration, it put other priorities first, priorities right. that they thought were key to get. So, so, so you had you know, um, the relief package, then you had infrastructure and probably immigration, voting rights may come before immigration and so forth. So some of these more nettlesome, contentious um, uh, efforts are probably gonna have to wait a bit. Um, so, um, and, 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 and when they do come, you know, um, the most likely scenarios that have been suggested is that you're going to get a dream act of some kind pushed forward initially, some kind of, um, effort to focus on farm workers um, as the most likely first two things, the first two bites, and then try to see if you can build incrementally from there. Why well, don't, Roberto, what do you think about that? Uh, tell us a little bit about what is in, we have the Dream and Promise Act, we have uh, the Dream Act with which Senator Durbin, <laughs> now this is 20 years that he has uh, reintroduced that time and again, again, uh, I believe that Senator uh, Lindsey Graham is his co-sponsor. So there is a kind of a little flash of um, bipartisanship there. Uh, but how do you see that? I mean, is this good legislation and do you think it can pass? How, what are the dreamers, how can they influence this? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. You know, I think that, you know, as opposed to, you know, Dan mentioning this kind of really massive, really massive bill, this is this is quite a bit more modest. Um, nevertheless, um, Migration Policy Institute estimates that, that about 4.4 million people could be eligible 
So we're talking about um, these categories, um, dreamers, um, those who are eligible for TPS. Um, I mentioned earlier the deferred enforcement departure, those who, are, who, who hold that status. And then what, what are being called legal dreamers. And these are children of parents who came to the US with certain types of temporary visas. And many of these young people may have aged out. Um, but you know, thinking about this, you know, it's as as you mentioned and I mentioned before. This has been twenty years, and and you know our um, elected officials like to tell us that change make takes time. And certainly, if we look historically, any progressive change in this country has taken years, if not decades, to accomplish. But these ideas don't square with the everyday lives of of kids and their families. Um, so we're you know we're several years into DACA, and what we what we don't need. Um, and I think that nobody from the immigrant rights community is pushing for over-legalization is kind of a preservation of DACA. Um, you know, I think that the, the long and the short of DACA is that it's arguably the, the most successful policy of immigrant integration in the last 20 to 30 years, clearly. Um, we saw in DACA young people taking giant leaps, being catapulted towards the American mainstreams mainstream new jobs, increasing their earnings, building up credit, um, driver's licenses, career trajectories that were on a, a very positive uh, step. But, but um, DACA doesn't address, doesn't provide a pathway to legalization. Um, it doesn't address exclusions from federal financial aid. Um, and these young people are part of families and communities that are in dire need of relief. So what does it mean to be a member of a family or a community uh, that also needs help? Um, so this is, uh, uh, legalization certainly is the tide that raises uh, most boats. And in this case, we're, we're talking about, you know, a segment, maybe, maybe a third of the population. And so, you know, while Democrats hold very thin majorities in, in both chambers, um, Republicans, it, it, it seems like, are, are less likely to support a broad path to citizenship for all undocumented immigrants. And so something like this might have a, have a chance. Um, but, but then again, many argue that it might have gone too far. So unlike other versions of the DREAM Act, uh, this one also covers TPS holders um, and those holding the, this DED status that I talked about. And so, um, so there will be that, that, that fight on that side. And I think that many people, many people within the, the dreamer community, the broader immigrants rights movement, um, will, will really want kind of more. Um, and will we be back to this, this argument of, of kind of pitting piecemeal policy versus kind of the big, more comprehensive piece? Um, it's, it's not clear, but I think that it's, I think that this, uh, I mean, certainly this bill has, I mean, it certainly has the, the support of the American public, but does it, have, does it have the kind of political capital to move forward, I think is a, is a major question. Um, Therese, I wanna ask you about, uh, just to um, bring us up to date on the border, um, just quickly, what ha has Biden changed? What has not changed and to what extent is, in order to fix the border, do we need some massive piece of legislation as well? Mm, that's a really good question. So, so to start with what, what the president has changed, I mean, the biggest thing that Biden, President Biden has changed is the rhetoric around immigration, frankly. Um, it's, you know, his, the way he talked about migrants and immigration, the way he made clear during his election that he wanted to undo what Trump had done uh, was a, such a significant change in, in how he spoke about immigrants that one of the things we know, because we have heard from immigrants say is that they thought that he would open the border. The reality is he hasn't actually opened the border. Um, in spite of a lot of executive orders signed early on, the biggest thing he did was stop border wall construction, but he hasn't taken down any of the border wall that was already there. Um, 
he uh, kept in place the Title 42 restrictions, the COVID era restrictions that President Trump put in place in April of 2020, um, that allows the United States to expel most immigrants who come to the border. So most of the single adults that are coming are being expelled right back from that. And an awful lot of families are still being expelled. And the way this uh, Title 42 order is being interpreted is that it supersedes all immigration law. So people are being expelled without any immigration process whatsoever, no ability to even try to claim asylum if that is their intent. The only exception he has made has been for the unaccompanied children. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we have seen an increase in unaccompanied children. The fact that the Title 42 order is also in place is one of the reasons why we see a lot of single adults right now. The majority of entrants are still single adults right now, many of whom have tried several times. They're called recidivists because they're not suffering any immigration consequences from the attempt or being expelled sometimes in a matter of hours back to Mexico, the opportunity cost of trying again is low. And so we're seeing repetitive attempts at crossing. Um, other programs, the migrant protection protocols that Trump had in place early in uh, 2018 and 2019 um, that required immigrants who were allowed to apply for asylum in the United States to wait in Mexico while their cases were heard. Uh, he, had, he ended new entrants into that um, program, although since President Trump had put Title 42 in place, pretty much nobody was put in MPP. But then he opened up pathways for many of them who had pending cases to come back into the United States. So they are registering in Mexico, taking COVID tests, and then subsequently being allowed in to continue their cases in the United States. But those are the only fundamental changes at the border. Um, and that's the fact that many migrants are finding out after making the long trek to the border only to be told that they're not going to be allowed in uh, to make an asylum claim. And I think that's one of the reasons why many immigration advocates are very frustrated with the Biden administration, because they expected a much more rapid un undoing, if you will, of many of Trump's policies. Um, but the reality is, as I said, uh, the Trump administration also left the Biden administration with a highly depleted infrastructure um, for processing migrants were they to take away these uh, restrictions. So I believe very strongly that one of the reasons the Biden administration has kept most of the Title 42 restrictions in place, it is a, because it's the one policy that allows them essentially to regulate the number of families and adults they have to manage. Uh, at the border um, and they can continue to expel them. Now, how much longer that policy is gonna remain in place is an open question. Uh, the Biden administration has made no articulation that it might move to end it, although many are urging them to, to do so. There is a lawsuit uh, that is out there that would um, about whether or not the use of Title 42 to supersede immigration law is even legal. So uh, the Biden administration is taking the Trump position in that uh, lawsuit right now, although they have asked the court to wait because they might intend to take it down. Um, but the, I think the bigger question is whether Mexico will continue to allow uh, the United States to turn migrants who aren't Mexican back into Mexico. Yeah, uh, that, is, that is something that the Trump administration essentially foisted onto Mexico uh, and they they took it, if you will. It was a unilateral action by the United States, but they acceded to it. Um, that I think the the current Mexican government is um, eager to sort of rid itself of. So I'm going to uh, just give Gia a chance before we go to questions uh, to uh, maybe comment on another very dramatic uh, situation that we've experienced in the, in uh, recent days, which was the shootings uh, in Atlanta and the focus on Asian immigration uh, that very sadly uh, came from that uh, violence. And, you know, in all, in so much of our discussion about uh, in reform and the system, we we don't really talk that much about Asian immigrants. And I'm wondering, you know, just looking at the the events in Atlanta, what what, what kind of impact did that have? Do you think uh, on the Asian community and on the 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 discussion in the United States about Asian immigrants? I mean, I think it just. It accentuated all the fears that people have been carrying around for this last year during the pandemic. I think it also has become a moment for you know, many Asian Americans to figure out what 
what is our political identity here? I mean, I think we talk a lot about policy. I do think there's something here where there are just millions of Asian Americans in this country that has never been the case before that we've had so many. And yet, what does it mean to be Asian American? What is this category? Um, I'd be curious if you polled actual Asian immigrants, how many would even identify as Asian American? But certainly, um, you know, when you have these anti-Asian hate crimes, the bigotry of other people has a way of uniting you, right? Because the bigot doesn't care if you're Korean or Chinese or Filipino, it's all the same to them. And so in that way, there is a new, I think potentially more unified identity emerging from all of this. Um, but it's also just, um, it's just very sad. I mean, I don't know what else to say. It's like being Asian for so long, Asian American has meant, um, you know, just sort of this provisional Americanness. Um, you see this in the immigration laws. I would argue, you know, and I argue in my book that the 1965 law, which allowed so many Asian families to be here, including my own, was really never intended to allow this many Asian um, Asian Americans to be here. There's testimony in Congress where people are saying, no, no, don't worry, there won't be Asians here. So I think there's this fear um, among some Asian Americans that this country doesn't really want us to begin with. And if you look at the history, I don't think there was ever a moment where the country said intentionally, we want millions of Asian Americans here. And so when there are these hate crimes, it just reinforces this basic kind of insecurity um, and sense in this tenuous sense of, are we even supposed to be here? What do people even wanna do with us? And so there's also this sort of toggling between like our Asians, you know, Asian Americans have been described as almost like white adjacent. They're not really people of color. You know, they're not this, they're not that. And so I think this is a really, as sad as this moment is, it's also a moment that demands some kind of um, political identity to emerge from a group that I think has struggled to articulate one. Um, and even if you can trace back the history to things like, you know, Daniel was talking about the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, that law and those Chinese immigrants have very little to do with the people who are here now. You know, I think as much as I love learning Asian American history, it's a whole different world of people here. And to try to draw a straight line, I think is sort of difficult. You know, what I try to do with my book, honestly, is to say the political lineage of Asian America is largely the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act. And if you can begin to understand that heritage, that legacy, then you can begin with some grounded idea of what it means to be Asian American. And, and what I would say is, you know, we've run out of time, but. That law is so important because it states emphatically that Americanness should not be tied to race or ethnicity. And so even if the law, when it's passed, does not intend to have all these Asian Americans come through family reunification and other, other priorities, right? The spirit of it is very much alive with us today in this country. It's what the entire fight over the Trump administration was about, right? It's about, does your race or ethnicity matter for whether you can be American? And so I think for Asian Americans trying to understand the heartbreak of this year, um, the pain and anguish of it, I think for people to look at the immigration history and to see how far we've come, even if some moments feel frankly accidental, that's something to work with. And it's a way to tie Asian Americans to the broader legacy of the fight for racial equality in this country. One that I think can feel hard to attach yourself to when your family is a relatively recent arrival. Um, but I think through immigration, there is the possibility for all kinds of unitedness across different groups. Um, and I think that's why tying immigration to the people who are here, right? It's like, you know, for me, a lot of this has been learning. Um, I think I used to think of immigration as like very abstract. It's a thing that Congress fights over. It's a thing that presidents fight over. But the fact of the matter is what happens in Congress is why my family is even here. It's, it's quite personal. And so I think as we think about how to talk about immigration, um, finding a way to connect it to people who are the descendants of immigrants, right? To say like your life was changed by these laws. If we're talking about a way forward with policy, I think it's important to try to bring it into people's lives and to say, but for these laws, your family would have had a very different life. You wouldn't have the papers that you have um, and that's what's happening here. It's not a thing that happens to other people. Who has papers and who does not affects us all because the laws can also change. You know, that's something I also learned from my research. You can decide tomorrow that these people don't count and these people do, and the paper itself doesn't have some kind of inherent significance. Um, so again, I think that's where tying 
a moment like right now for Asian Americans to immigration explicitly to say, this is not about the border alone. This is about what it means to be American and what it means that your family is here and how your family is actually bind, bound very tightly with the families that are also at the border trying to come in here. Okay, well, that's a tremendously great place to um, leave the discussion and go to the questions. And uh, so uh, here's a question that um, maybe Dan or Roberto, do you consider it fair to allow illegal immigrants before in before legal immigrants? So this is, Dan, maybe you wanna answer that question because this is the, this is the this is the underlying, this question articulates the underlying dynamic of immigration reform. Do you consider it fair to allow illegal immigrants in before legal immigrants? So um, I think, Teresa, someone else kind of invoked Bill Clinton at a moment, a moment of the Clinton administration. And, you know, one of the big metaphors that Clinton talked about was, you know, rewarding those who play by the rules and those who don't. And so one of the things that, you know, was carted out in the 1990s and has been with us for a long time is the idea that, you know, um, legal immigrants are waiting patiently. There actually is no really, in truth, there is no line, but we, we think of the metaphor of the line and they're waiting patiently and others are cutting in line. Um, and so if you take that approach, you can say ethically, it, it is unfair. However, if you think about actually the trajectory of kind of America's insatiable appetite for cheap labor, whether that labor is authorized, documented or undocumented, you, you have a very different different picture of what's ethically um, right on this. So the fact that you know we can we can talk about almost any decade of American history in which we've had a big wink on you know certain policies in law, um, but in fact have had very you know um, a, a kind of unending dependence and desire for cheap undocumented labor. And so, you know, we, there was conversation earlier, I think Teresa raised the Bracero program, which starts in the 1940s um, and is meant to be addressed kind of, as they put it, the war manpower problem, and yet exists until 1963, long after the war, because that contract labor was, you know, um, you know basically so desired by American employers. And in tandem with that, um, that legal contract labor, which was very exploited, uh, by the way, but that's a whole other conversation. We had um, similar um, uh, streams of undocumented um, immigrants coming into the country. And, um, and the INS at the time, you know, basically, here's where the big wink comes in, you know, was not really enforcing, at least not during harvest season, um, in a consistent fashion. And so we can we can fast forward to to recent decades and again where you know um, we had a system that um, basically relied very strongly on undocumented labor because it was cheap, tractable, um, and useful um, in in doing a lot of jobs that a lot of Americans don't want. And when you think about it in those terms, you might have a very different perspective on on, on what is fair and unfair. If, if I can put, pick up on, 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 on Dan's important points, you know, I think that at the height of the Bracero program, the United States is recruiting upwards of 500,000 labor migrants per year. Um, and uh, in fact, beyond that number, uh, growers couldn't get enough of workers. And so we're, we're actually recruiting workers through quote unquote illegal channels. And so you got this massive number of migrants who are making these return trips and this becomes very regular part of labor migration. Bracero program ends 1963, 1964, and 1965. You know, we've talked about um, we've talked about the 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 Hart Seller Act of 1965 is that we put a uh, we put numerical restrictions on the Western Hemisphere, 120,000, and Mexico by 1976 is subject to country of origin quotas of 20,000 per year. So we've got this huge bottleneck. So we've got this pension for, for cheap, flexible, pliant labor um, and more than 500,000 annually. And suddenly, right, is that we've got, we've got Mexico subject to these country of origin quotas in this the Western hemisphere quota. And we've got, what, what happens is that the 
So labor migration doesn't change. It doesn't slow down until, you know, 2007, 2008. But what we have is the, 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 the auspices under which people, migrants arrived have changed. And so they, they become undocumented. Undocumented immigrants today, the vast majority of, of, of adult undocumented immigrants have been here, they're, they're long-term stayers. So the average, I think the, the, the median stay is more than 13 years. So more than 75% of this undocumented population has been here for more than 15 years. And so we have to ask these really tough questions. And I, I can understand that during a time of pandemic, during a time of economic downturn, these are some very difficult questions. But these are, these are, 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 are people who are part of our communities, who are part of our communities of faith, who have ties to, to their neighbors, to, again, to communities of faith, to employers. Um, to their their kids' teachers, and so how do we how do we address a population that has been here that has grown roots here? Is a really I think is a really important question. Teresa, did you want to respond also? Yeah, I just want to point out something that Dan said, and maybe elaborate on it. I, I mean, this uh, this question um, comes from a belief that the legal immigration system actually works that it's easy to get in line and get a visa. And these are people that just choose not to do that. And the fact of the matter is that the legal immigration system, particularly if you're coming for work, is extraordinarily difficult and restrictive. Um, for some countries and some nationalities and some categories, you can stay and wait in that line for 50 years or longer. So is that really a line? And I think, you know, Going back to the idea that when did we last fix our immigration system, IRCA in 1986 married legalization of what was then about 3.3 million undocumented immigrants with increased border security and employment verification and enforcement mechanisms, but didn't address the legal immigration system at all. The next time we did that was in 1990, where we sort of tweaked the existing system that we inherited from 1965, um, but we didn't really expand it. Here we are some almost 40 years later with a system that is very outdated that allows these long backlogs to fill, um, which really is not a system that is workable, which is roundly criticized for being more complicated than the tax system for people to try to navigate. And yet we have this idea that somehow, well, you should do it, just do it the legal way. I would say that that is, that doesn't work anymore because the legal system itself is broken in so many ways. And so we need to address the undocumented for all of the reasons that Dan and Roberto mentioned, but we also need to fix our legal immigration system. And frankly, if we wanna secure the border and have people come in a legal way, rather than you know coming to the border without authorization or papers, then we need to fix the legal immigration system and give them avenues that actually work to try to do right. that. Um, Julia, may I make a comment as uh, you, you may, we were, we're still on the first question. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. go ahead. I, no, as no. A, as a member of the board of the JFK um, Library Foundation, it took two Irish American politicians, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill to make the deal to uh, regularize the um, act that- uh, 1986. Just uh, mentioned, two Irish American politicians. <laughs> so Marcelo, I think there's a question here that you might be answering. It says, wouldn't it be more efficacious if the US spent all the money they are now spending on enforcement in a Marshall Plan for Central America? I think most people would like to stay in their own country if they felt safe and could earn a decent living rather than enter into the dangerous chaos that now exists. You wanna take a shot at that, Marcelo? And, and maybe, Teresa, you have some thoughts about that as well. Thank you so much. Uh, 75 years of data, 75 years of basic research has one, makes one point and one point uh, only. At any given moment in human history, less than 3% of the world's population is on the move beyond the country of birth, meaning, Homo sapiens sapiens, um, all things equal, would rather not migrate. Uh, so the right not to migrate 
is a, is a fundamental uh, right, especially in the context of the catastrophic migrations of the 21st century. So uh, smart long-term um, investments in the regions of the world that today are sending the largest uh, numbers of forced migrants, forced migrants, um, would be both humanitarian, humanitarian, ethical, and a, and a very good investment in the long term. Having said that, I believe that the right to migrate is a fundamental uh, human right. Uh, immigration is a shared condition of our humanity. Immigration is written on our DNA. It's in our a stereoscopic vision, it's in our bipedalism, it's in our central nervous system. Immigration makes us human. Immigration is the shared experience of humanity. Two things are true. People should have the right to migrate. People should also have the right not to migrate. So um, investing differently in uh, initiatives that would enable people to offer uh, the fundamental dignity, the fundamental uh, capacities to stay and not have to migrate should be a smart and wise uh, investment. Um, Teresa, it, uh, the Biden administration has, has embraced this concept uh, it, to the extent that you, one wonders, he's, he's sp speaking so much about root causes. He's named Vice President Harris to go down and negotiate with the countries in Central America uh, to uh, develop programs to address the root causes of migration. But so on one hand, this does seem to be the policy of the Biden administration. But on the other hand, is this going to be, is this going to happen soon enough? Well, I, I agree with Marcelo that, um, you know, addressing the reasons that people are migrating in the first place is ultimately how you, you know, reduce migration that is forced, that uncontrolled and irregular migration is one way to look at it. You reduce that when you don't force people to have to leave. That is a long and complicated investment process. And I would say that, you know, President Biden or knows that because when he was vice president under Obama, President, vice president Obama sent him to Central America to do just that, right? He was charged with creating what was then the uh, 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 America's, uh, Amer uh, the prosperity plan for Americas. And, um, you know, so he understands that. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's leaning into this root cause argument. Um, I think it's absolutely necessary and it's something that we need to invest in for the future, but it is also a very long-term proposition. And we cannot ignore the fact that American intervention in many of these countries in Central America over several decades is one of the reasons why they are tough places for people to stay right now. The criminal gangs that are rampant down there started many of them in the, in the prisons in the United States when uh, earlier, migrants from those countries came uh, and joined and learned gangs from uh, gangs in prison and took them back home. Uh, we have issues of corruption uh, in the governments there, uh, impunity that is rampant. Um, so we have to be very careful and cautious how we uh, get on our white horse and trot down there and say, we're gonna fix it, right? Like we, we have to learn from the, from, from the past. Um, and figure out how we do it. I think that what the Biden administration is proposing and what is absolutely necessary is a regional plan, that it has to absolutely involve Mexico. It has to involve the countries in the region. It has to involve Costa Rica and Panama and Nicaragua and any other country that is able and willing to, uh, to, to help with what is essentially a hemispheric issue. We should invite our Northern neighbors from Canada as well. Um, it can't just be the United States, but it is, it's, a, it's a necessary investment, absolutely. Is it gonna solve our problem at the border in the next two to four years? No, no, I don't think so. So we have to also invest in our own processes. Um, we have to invest in a system that can, that can manage the migration, that can give people a way to make their claim, uh, decide if they're able to stay, and if not, then return them, but return them in safety. Um, 
and and manage that from that end. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, yeah. can, I make, can I make a 15 second point? Yes. Is, to me, um, in thinking about a Marshall Plan, as, as the questioner put it, um, one of the critical ingredients is, would there be, is it capacious enough to include something that addresses climate change? Because I think climate refugees is such a huge challenge going forward. And so, you know, one has to ask, no matter how much money and addressing human rights and so forth, as, you know, climate crises, you know, loom for us, you know, already is having a dramatic impact on people's movement. Um, and I wonder, Marcelo, you know, noting that roughly 3% and, you know, that's been for a long time of people who want to move. But again, as we, we face these stresses um, surrounding, you know, our changing environment, you know, one wonders where we are 10 years from now, if that number goes up um, as a result of, of just that stress. Um, we have a question, which is how has the pandemic affected immigration to the United States? So who wants to grab that one? That that we could talk all night about that. Yeah, go ahead, Marcel. The pandemic, the pandemic brought immigration to uh, a real halt globally. If you look at the data, uh, for two reasons: one, borders were shut, and internally, by the way, the largest movements of people worldwide today are in Asia, and they're not in the Americas. Uh, you have internal controls that it, it prevented the movements of people, both internationally as well as internally within nation states. So uh, the pandemic has um, just dramatically changed the flows, albeit uh, temporarily, uh, over, over, the last, um, over the last year. Uh, the data on this are very, very uh, uh, clear. Uh, and I would Not just add- force of migrations. Not yeah. force of migrations. Um, I would add that that migration to the United States because of the sequence of uh, orders that President Trump put in place, uh, first the green card uh, ban and then the temporary visa ban, um, have reduced uh, legal immigration to the United States, both for temporary and permanent, by close to 80% in the last year. Um, and uh, even though President Trump has now let those bans, well, took them away and then let one lapse today, um, it, the consulates overseas that process legal visas are still operating at significantly reduced capacity. And there are backlogs of hundreds of thousands of applications waiting to be processed, um, some of which will expire and people will lose their chance to come to the United States legally um, if that isn't caught up. So the, the, even though Marcelo is correct, it, it's a temporary pause uh, due to COVID, the recovery from this temporary pause uh, could take quite a long time to see. Yeah, Gia, did you want to reflect on that as well? Um, you started to talk about it before, but you know, obviously, the pandemic has made the United States acutely aware that it's on the same planet with China, and um, um, I don't know. Do you want to reflect on that? Um, I guess the only thing I would say is that I feel like this event and sort of what's become of our passports is again a reminder of how um, of how man-made all of these rules around where we can go are, that they can change at any time. I mean, suddenly we, we have these passports that are supposed to allow us to go everywhere, but because we've so mismanaged the pandemic, our ability to move around the world has been severely restricted. And so one thing I'm curious about is you know, as we come out of this pandemic, what does that mean for any kind of, you know, even any movement around the world, right? Beyond just um, people having visas and being able to, uh, you know, officially migrate somewhere. What is, what is the movement of human people around the globe going to look like if, you know, wealthy countries do not help uh, pay for and provide vaccines to much of, you know, to, to developing countries that can't afford it now? So, just as a broad thought, it, it reminds me again of how contingent our ability to move around the world is. And I think that's something that some Americans maybe take for granted because we have, um, you know, if you're born here and you're sort of used to this like freedom of movement, I think the pandemic is a bit of a wake up call potentially that it's not so easy to decide that you're gonna show up in other countries just as other people struggle to come here as well. It's just that sort of the arrow is kind of pointing in the other direction now in a way that maybe is uncomfortable for us. 
Okay, we have time for one. one yeah, I, I just wanted yeah, to say, go ahead. You know, I think that the, the related question to this is, you know, what is what has this pandemic done to to immigrants residing in the right. United States, right? Um, and we've certainly seen uh, it, it exacerbate inequalities um, with Im with immigrant families, with immigrant and mixed status households. You've got adults who are essential workers. Um, you've got households that have not been eligible for the relief, the, co the, the COVID relief. Um, you've got um, a massive crisis in the public education system with immigrant families really struggling to keep up. Um, you've got, you know, we, we, we see um, older children who are, are taking care of their younger siblings. We see Wi-Fi connectivity problems. You see the, the digital divide um, and education gaps growing. Um, so it's had untold effects. I think that, you know, we'll be, we'll be studying this for, for years to come. Indeed. Um, uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, the U.S. population is slowing. Do we not need an increase in our labor force to have a growing economy? Um, so, um, three things. Um, in the long term, uh, demographically, immigrants behave like um, fertility-wise, like the encompassing uh, populations where they settle, meaning that um, the rates of live births um, uh, tend to migrate with the migration towards the national norms, meaning in the long term, immigration is not a, a real uh, solution. Second, uh, the average number of live births in Mexico has uh, collapsed. Uh, Mexico entered the demographic transition uh, with a vengeance. Uh, the average uh, Mexican woman today has in the order of 2.4, 2.5 live uh, births. A generation ago, a generation is 20 years, uh, she had something like close to seven live births. So uh, um, the, the, uh, the claim of, the no, of, of, of the number of immigrants that are required as a function of the labor force uh, is a claim that uh, has been studied very, very carefully, and there are fundamental uh, limits. Uh, in the context of um, automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, computer-assisted design, the nature of work is fundamentally changing. And what's important to keep in mind is that both at the very, very high end of the opportunity structure and at the low end of the opportunity structure, immigrants tend to complement the skills of the native born force. Very few of us are gonna either win the Nobel Prize or are high school dropouts, okay? Immigrants tend to be overrepresented in the category of winners of the Nobel Prize and folk with very low levels of education and skill. So a claim qua labor functions is that the complementarity of immigrant labor has worked very, very well, especially in this look the other way culture that Dan uh, talked about earlier. But fundamentally, it has been a conceptual error, in my estimation, to reduce migration to labor and to units of work. In my world, immigration is an ethical act of and for the family. Immigration is for the family. The family begins immigration. It's at the level of the household. And the momentum that immigration sustains is all driven by kinship and social organization. So in my estimation, it is better to think through uh, the need for labor in the context of a clear, open-eyed view that when we want immigrants, we want the whole human being. We don't want the Veraceros. The Veraceros, the very name, 
tells you everything you need to know. Arms for labor. No. Immigration is an ethical act of and for the family. The family unit begins it, immigration changes the family. One family begins it, a very different family. Culturally, structurally, completes the immigration cycle down the road. So, okay. thank you. <laughs> well, we have to unfortunately leave it there, but it's a, it's a wonderful thought. And uh, so I just want to thank everybody. This was an incredibly rich and broad discussion. And um, thank you again to the Kennedy Library for bringing us all together for uh, a remarkably wide ranging uh, conversation on uh, this very dynamic and difficult and hopefully productive issue. Thank,